We are witnessing America as a failed social experiment. How do we tell this story in a way that builds the kind of emotional momentum that colorblind ideology builds? So many young brothers and sisters of the younger generation find themselves so far removed from the best of their past. What are we going to make out of the nothing we've been given? How do you envision possibility? Hey everyone, welcome and thanks for joining us on The Tightrope, where we engage in rich dialogue and try to keep our balance on tough issues. I'm Trisha Rose, here with my co-host and dear friend, Cornell West. All right, Doc, off the record, we just got to check in. It's crazy times. It's dizzyingly insane. And I want to know what's going on in the life of your mind. We all want to know how you've been handling this multi-level crisis as if there wasn't a crisis before the crisis but how are well, you well i hear you i hear well, one i just want to begin by saluting you though sister trisha because you are such an inspiration to me and so many others and when you think about this particular moment it's a moment actually of glee because it's unprecedented there's unbelievable possibilities and breakthroughs people on the street waves of awakening, spiritual, moral, and political. Now, of course, at the same time, I'm on lockdown, but I'm not locked in. That I call my loved ones every day, beginning with my precious mama, Irene. I got my reading group with my Morehouse brothers, with Eddie and Mark, and the two mm -hmm. Charles. We read Turgenia's Fathers and Sons. We read Herzog by Saul Bellow. We're reading Richard Wright's The Man Who Lived Underground. We're on our way to Tony Morris and Ann Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground. Now, preparing for our dear sister Alexandria, this historic figure already, she's making history. It continues to make mm -hmm. history. I had to steal away and listen to some Rafael Hernandez. Mm -hmm. I had to listen to some Preciosa. I had to listen to Lamento. Boracanio. I had to listen to some Pedro <laughs> Flores. These are towering artists come out of Puerto Rico. I had to read some mm. poetry by Sister Borgos, Julia de Borgos, who's the greatest poet who died right there in New York mm. City in her 30s. So that the artists help sustain me, uh, mm. even though I'm trying to remain organically connected. I've been blessed to do almost 101 podcasts since the uprising. So I've been running around like a chicken with my head cut off, sitting in the same place. Yeah, well, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, and that's but a how great do you how do you see. sustain yourself? Well, how do you sustain yourself? Well, you making me look like a slacker, there, brother. I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't have fourteen weeding groups. I'm just grateful I can get up, walk around. You know, I had knee replacement surgery a few weeks ago, so yeah, oh yeah. the fact that I've walked away from the walker, I'm feeling like I've been, you know, saved and brought back to life. So, um, but, but I mean, I also, you know, I, I think the richness of the arts are critical and, you know, Puerto Rican music and poetry are extraordinary murals, poetry, you know, music, dance, amazing. Um, but there's also a lot of death and sadness, you know, I mean, I mean, I think you're right to focus on how we enrich ourselves, but yeah. I, you know, I, it's a, it's a very sad moment. I think, I think even a lot of the rage and the insanity that we see of people behaving in ways I cannot make a single bit of sense out of, you know, running around talking about, you can't make me wear a mask. I'm like, it's like you wear a seatbelt. You came over here with a seatbelt, <laughs> but you won't put a mask on. But anyway, yeah, no, that's um, true. but that's when you true. think of this crazy behavior, you know, it's, I think there's a kind of, uh, you know, lizard brain level of fear that people are living from. And so I guess I was, you know, I was really, honing in on that in some ways but again you have the answers always which is really arts community being uh locked in what did you say locked in but not locked away or not locked locked down but not locked, locked down in. but not locked but, in right and see i would right. say that i don't have any answers you know it's like the conclusion of an aristotelian syllogism which is not a proposition or an answer it's just a bodily intellectual action deed life live mode of being in the world right, you see, it, it's right, it's it's right. word made flesh there's no 
real right. answer. There's no answer to why there's so much suffering and why people catching hell and poor people not yeah. respected. The response is intervention. The response mm -hmm. is forms of action. The reform, the response is certain kinds of praxis. And that's right. all we mortals can do. That's all that we uh, human beings can do in time and space. You know what I mean? That, that's, that's, that's very wise. That's wise because really, you know, Americans in particular, and certainly the modern West thinks there's a literal answer for everything. Uh, and that that's really right. takes us away from the way to live through crisis. Um, that's e and, that's uh, exactly so, right. You know, that, that is the answer. But I still, you know, you're better at it than I am. Let me just leave it at that. But I'm going to get well, my reading no, groups together. You done, you done made it clear. I need me a reading group. So. <laughs> I'm well, the thing is, with, with, with our dear sister, sister AOC, uh, uh, exactly. AOC I was, on the way, and that her life in. already is a response and an intervention to exactly. not just structures of domination, but the very structures of feeling mm -hmm. that are more impoverished these days, underdeveloped so notions true. of empathy, compassion. And, yep. uh, and 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 right. you know she's not even uh, right. And the answer. Not even well, actually, let me introduce yet. her before I before no, we tell her all. Not until yes. October, and she already becomes exemplary. Go right. <laughs> <laughs> well, as many of you listening should know by now, we have a fantastic, amazing guest with us today. Very fortunate to have a third generation Bronxite educator, organizer, whose meteoric rise to prominence took the political stage and social media by storm. She now serves as the 14th District Representative of New York in the Bronx and Queens, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, affectionately and formidably known as AOC. <laughs> she grew up experiencing the reality of Bronx's pre-gentrification out-of-borough economic fragility, New York's rising income inequality, and both of these inspired her to organize her community and run for office on a progressive and inspirational platform that rejects corporate packed funds. Not only is she breaking away from the status quo, but she's making history, having taken office at the age of 29, becoming the youngest woman to ever be elected to Congress. AOC, you're on the tightrope, and thank you so much for joining us. Of course, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. I want to just start off where Dr. West was just about to go and uh, invite him to follow up just as after my prod here, which is, you know, this question of the sort of uh, the moral spiritual nature of your political interventions. Cornell, did you want to say a little bit more about that? Because you were you were going right there. I just want to get the introduction well, in so we can no, get right on with it. I, I, I love your question. But see, when, when I see Sister Alexandra, you know, I see Blanca. I see Sergio. I see the tradition that comes out of that island. I be so campos. I was just lecturing to him at Harvard Law, graduated first class in 1921. The racist professors wouldn't allow him to give the lecture. I see Lolita Lebron, who was my dear sister, who I knew very well, right when she came out of jail and so forth. So that how would you account for the moral and spiritual dimensions of your calling, I guess, as the ALC? I mean, I think, um... It's just, I think so much of where I've been blessed to be and the journey that I've been blessed with in my life um, is not so much a result of individual choice. Um, you know, while that certainly plays a role, while, while I have agency in my life, um, I also recognize that I am just one person that's part of a greater context. You know, I am one point that is a result of waves of generational inertia of thousands, if not millions of people that have been fighting for justice in small and large ways. And, um, and I'm just kind of one part of that constellation. But in my life growing up, um, I didn't grow up in a particularly political household in, in the explicit or traditional sense. Um, we're certainly very political in that our family discussed politics, we discussed current events, but no one in my family was explicitly political. In fact, I grew up in a household that was proudly independent. We often voted for Democrats, but um, but it was a household where, you know, my father and my mother, we grew up and we said, you know, we don't identify 
our identity is not of a political party. Our identity is about trying to do best by everyday people and knowing right from wrong. And you cannot allow your identity to be kind of subsumed with this superficial political identity of red or blue or this tribe, you know, this, that, and the other. And so um, it, I, every single aspect of the way my parents raised me was about what is the right thing to do and how can we be more conscious of our actions um, and, and how can we always be improving in our, in our actions. You know, I was listening to you, Dr. West, and you were talking about, um, about you know, not taking actions and engaging in conversations that are not propositions or proposals or conclusions. And I think that's a lot of how I grew up. It's how, how not what do you want to be, but how do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And um, that just has always been guiding my decisions. And in fact, when I, you know, when I was younger and I had just graduated college, I was, I think like many young graduates, especially during that time, after the end of the Great Recession, um, there was, there's so much pressure on what you want to be what you want to accomplish, what stature or what achievement or what goal do you have in life? And, um, and I found that when I tried to map my path in those terms, I was deeply unhappy. Mm. And when I started focusing more on how I want to be, um, I was much happier, even when I was a waitress. And even though that station in life um, superficially and in our kind of capitalist economy would say, you should want better than that. Um, I was happiest because my how was, um, was in harmony with who I wanted to be. And that allowed me to lead myself to, to lead, or at least attempt to lead a moral life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, everybody agrees about you is your deep sense of humanity, your sense of humor, and your sense of humility to be able to have a moral tenacity that's grounded in a humility. Is that connected to, I know it's got to connect to your parents. You couldn't smile on both of their faces, one from the grave and the other strong as ever. But is, is it also connected to a religiosity? Is it a Christian faith like Campos, who was a devout Catholic and he was revolutionary? He's with the Irish, he's with the Indians, he's with the Puerto Ricans, he's with Black people, he's with poor whites, so he's got that universality grounded in particularity. Where does your spirituality come from? Yeah, you know, I grew up in a very deeply spiritual household. Ah, um, ah. And it's funny because my parents kind of practiced in two different ways. Um, my father was raised Catholic and my mother uh, is Pentecostal. And so I grew up kind of between these two worlds. I was kind of raised in a, in a, I was more consistently raised in the Catholic tradition. I was baptized. I had my confirmation, first communion, um, but during the summertime, you know, my parents couldn't afford childcare. And so during the summers, they often sent me to Puerto Rico to live with my aunts and my uncles, where um, it was very often that they would drive um, up to the mountains and me along with them since I was a wow. child. And wow, I'd drive nice. up to the mountains, deep, deep, deep up. And, and in Puerto Rico, you know, some of these churches are, are, way up in the mountains the roads aren't even paved and we'd be in this car or this van kind of on these careening um muddy roads to get to uh, uh that were dark um to get to the top of a church top of a mountain um to a small kind of tucked away church and um and there you know i i witnessed a lot of the pentecostal tradition um mm -hmm. and which is 
has a lot of similarities with the with the with the Black Baptist tradition here. Oh, in the indeed, States, indeed. With the role of music and um, and people catching the spirit and all of those things. So I kind of grew up between in a, I grew up between two worlds in so many different ways between the Bronx mm -hmm. and Westchester, between the United States and Puerto Rico, between rich and poor, and um, and spiritually that applies as well. I grew up with the very rigid, disciplined, um, you know, deeply studious Catholic tradition. I went to CCD and all of that, um, but also with the kind of wild and uproarious um, uh, Protestant tradition or rather Pentecostal tradition as well. And, um, but even with that, you know, my father was a very deeply philosophical man. Um, mm. Uh, a people will call him a closet intellectual because he grew up poor. He took a lot of pride in being of the people and not being above anyone. And he told off color jokes all the time. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but when no one was looking, he'd be reading the Bhagavad Gita and he'd be reading, um, you know, he'd be reading. And as a child, I grew up kind of finding these little books around. And I just, I was a total daddy's girl. And so anything that he did, I wanted to do. And so um, I, I just consumed so many books as a kid. And so, you know, even in that Christian and, and Catholic tradition, I grew up questioning a lot. Um, I grew mm -hmm. up challenging a lot of, of uh, the, the things that were kind of told to me that I was raised with. Um, and I also kind of grew up with just a predisposition of, of curiosity. How do other people find God? How do, you know, I had a lot of, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of Jewish friends. I had a lot of Asian friends and, um, and Christian friends of different disciplines. And, um, and I always was just very curious about how of all of the myriad ways of finding God, of finding love, of finding peace, of finding and cherishing humanity in the world. And so, um, so I didn't really grow up in a very dogmatic type of way. Right. So when he passed at 48, you were at BU. I'm, I'm right here in Cambridge, right at Harvard, right on the other side of the Charles River, right? right. But, uh, uh, how, how did you come to terms with that? And how's that connected to your witness now? Going back to Mr. Trisha's crucial question. Oh, about the I mean, it's, um, it just goes so deep, you know, and, mm. um, and it's funny because uh, in terms of what I do now, I think a lot of people always try to analyze my actions in a strictly political context, you know, She's a Marxist or this or that. And I did not grow up reading any of these texts until I was much, much older. And it's just, I, oh, I was already here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that this was, was a shaped. political way of being. That's right. That's I just right. thought it was a moral way of being. And it turns That's out right. that, you know, it's, mm. it's all, there's also kind of a, a, a way you can contextualize this within a political framework. But, mm. um, but when my father passed away, you know, as, as I said, he and I just shared we were like one, you know, there, I think mm. some people just have very, very special relationships in their lives, you know, some, whether it's mother, daughter, or mother, son, right. or father, daughter, or grandparent, grandchild, um, just some, you know, a lot of people are very blessed to, to have just one relationship no matter who it is too, that is just so deep um, mm. that it almost feels like a soul tie. And mm -hmm. when you see that person, you know, you feel truth, you feel home um, and you feel growth. And that was my father to me. He was like my everything. And I know that, um, that you know, I played a, a very special role in his life as well. And so, um, so we shared this very special bond and it's, it's difficult because when someone like that passes away, it's not an, 
it's not an insult to any of the other people that you love very deeply in your life, um, right. but it can feel right. like an unmooring. It can feel like you don't have a home anymore and you feel just profoundly alone. Mm. And there's a lot of guilt that frankly I, I struggled with because why should I feel so alone when I still have my mother and my brother and my grandmother, but I felt alone in the universe. Um, mm. So alone that that the next year I studied abroad and I spent four months in West Africa, living in West Africa. Mm. Mm. And, um, and my father's passing was very much um, part of that decision, um, which kind of, I think, was the first, one of the first domino falls that I think kind of set me on a very larger trajectory personally in my life. Um, because I just felt, you know, I felt so alone. And sometimes the way to heal from that is to just be alone. You know, it's, mm. it can be very painful when you are alone, yet are surrounded. Um, and so sometimes you just need solitude. And That's so um, I always knew that I wanted to study abroad in college because uh, I didn't, aside from visiting my family in Puerto Rico, I never really had the opportunity to travel or anything like that growing up, see other countries. And I, you know, I had the opportunity to go to Niger and um, it just felt like such an incredible opportunity to me because anyone can get on a plane and go to London or Paris if you're blessed enough, you know, it's a matter of resources, but going to visit and spend time in community in a place like Niger, it takes more than resources. It takes people, it takes community. Um, and so I, I thought it was just a, a wonderful opportunity to go. And so I went there. Um, at the time I entered college as a pre-medical student and, um, mm. and mm. I was interested in, in public health, but I was interested in healing. And more, mm. specifically, ooh, more specifically, I actually wanted to be an OBGYN. Um, Ooh, and so I went to Niger, um, to work with midwives and I went there and I did rotations, uh, with midwives helping Nigerian women, um, and Nigerian, you know, Nigerian parents give birth. Um, and it was just a profoundly spiritual and radicalizing experience. And, um, just seeing how like the strength of these women and the way of life. And I remember feeling at that time that Americans were so poor. Mm. Um, yes, because yes. Yeah. I, I found friendship and I would spend time, you know, the whole evening would be spent preparing tea over fire with friends and just talking and listening to music. And, um, and that level of enjoyment just does not exist in American life. You know, this is something that people do on a Friday night, maybe once a week if they aren't exhausted by work. Um, but this is a way of life in Niger that Absolutely. people every single evening, you would spend, sorry, my, my dog is barking in the background. No, that's fine. But, that's fine. <laughs> they're in agreement. But every single, <laughs> every single evening, though, was like, that was the point. That interaction was the sun around which life revolved around. It's our fellowship and connection to one another. And in the United States, you know, the contrast here was, um, work is the sun that your whole life is organized around and everything is the mar everything is in the margins. Oh, margins. But in Niger, family, community, connection, that is the sun and everything else mm. is organized around that. Um, let, me, let me ask you a question related to wow, that. Wow, that's powerful. That's, okay that's powerful. Me. I'm uh, telling it's you. It's so powerful. Whew, that's powerful. I mean, just, right it, it, Good it, God so, almighty. 
put so many pieces together, you know, um, in, in such a beautiful way. Um, but especially your, you know, this question of, you know, women's community around giving birth and um, the sort of spiritual uh, gendered nature of that power and, and importance. I mean, I think that feels like another place that we're very impoverished in our country. Um, did you, were you acutely aware of, you know, this kind of women's community and how powerful it was? And, and did you compare it to the same kinds of issues we see here around a lack of appreciation for what a women's community can bring? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I think, well, growing up, I grew up kind of a tomboy. I grew up around a lot of boys. All of my cousins were boys. You know, I had, the girls were outnumbered. <laughs> so growing up, I grew up wrestling <laughs> with my cousins and my brothers nice. and things like that. And so, um, so yeah, that experience was very powerful because it was very new for me. I didn't, I, I, you know, I, I, I did not have a sister. I have a younger brother and all of that. And so, um, and so I didn't really grow up around that, that kind of powerful collective and the feminine and, um, and it, you know, it was the first time I really saw that kind of strength um, and that fellowship and that intimacy. And in fact, in Niger, um, you know, the, the, the gynecologist, the gynecologist or the obstetrician is, um, is actually not allowed in the birthing room unless the nurses call him in. And so, or unless the midwives call them in. So for the most part, it is a, it was, it's a women's only space. Um, and the, the mother would come in, um, and be set on a table and, um, you know, the disparities were so great as well. You know, at the time Niger ranked last in the UN human development index. So Ooh. I saw a lot of things that were also quite traumatizing. Um, but what women carried and the strength that women carried, um, was one of the things that had touched me so much but mm. I think there was also just there was a lot of uh traumatizing experience there as well yeah. um you know I I I remember I was I was 19 years old and I was helping these midwives and there was this young woman who was my age 19 years old and she was up on the birthing table and uh her her son was stillborn and um and Everything about that experience from holding her hand, um, from trying to revive this child uh, was, was also just so uh, transformative um, because I just felt that if you, if you are born with the lottery ticket, uh, whatever lottery ticket that that may be, loving parents, um, being born in a materially wealthy nation like the United States, uh, we cannot afford to waste that um, because birth itself is a privilege. And that applies in the United States as well, where Black women have some of the highest maternal mortality rates in the developed world. Um, but that community of, of women um, and, and that power is what kept the glue together, even in such horrifying circumstances like that. Mm -hmm. So how did you translate all of that when you came back? Because that kind of traveled, as I can tell from your telling it now, it changes you, right? It, it doesn't ever leave you. Um, it sort of reorients your whole kind of DNA. Um, how did you feel it manifested in terms of your political uh, engagements, right? Because you, you just, it can't be but a couple of years later, you had to have started to think about the trajectory you're on now. Can you walk us through how you got to that and, and why, you, why you went in this direction? Yeah, well, I remember when I, when I first went, um, I was already questioning my path uh, as a pre-medical student because I, I had already felt that treating one patient at a time 
um, for me personally, while immensely gratifying, I also saw even in my own community how how what you are treating and what you are healing is a result of systematic outcomes. And I knew that people would continue to be sick if our systems continued to be sick. And so when I when I decided to go to Niger, you know, it was on it, it was at this kind of crossroads of do I still want to follow this path or do I want to explore something larger? So I actually went um, under kind of a public health program, which was kind of the, the juxtaposition of policy and health work. Um, and I was studying a, a lot. And um, when I came back, I decided that I wanted my work to be more macro level. And I wanted to focus on healing six uh, systems. But, you know, when you're when you're growing up, and again, I didn't grow up with that political context. Um, I did not know that, I didn't really think about this in terms of a capitalistic uh, system or analysis or any of that. I just knew that we were sick. I knew that kind of our society had symptoms of illness. Um, and I didn't know what it was. You know, I was 19 years old. So it, I think of my life more as a metal detector than following directions or anything like that. And so I would go one direction and there's no beep. And then you go another direction and it's. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And so, um, <laughs> so that's how I feel like I've always lived my life. And even to this day, people say, you know, what do you want to do five years from now? And I say, I don't know. You know, wh whatever I'm called to do is what I'll do. But I, I often. I often feel like my decisions are revealed to me then planned very far ahead. And so, um, so, you know, when I came back, I switched I, my majors, I studied economics, um, which immediately I knew was the right decision. I felt it was just uh, immensely gratifying um, because I started to have the tools, at least in a very academic context of analyzing systems. I could do math to analyze systems. I could look at millions of people on a chart and, um, and, and also kind of overlay that. It was kind of half art, half science, um, because you still have to tell the story. And that's the interesting thing about economics is that there may be an equation, but the real quest is discovering the story that has led to a number. And so um, I knew that my metal detector was beeping. I also uh, continued to study uh, international relations. And so I graduated with dual degrees. But, um, but during that time, I had uh, probably my, my most enriching experience was that I crossed paths with the Howard Thurman Center for Common Ground at Boston University. Now, Boston University is where Martin Luther King uh, got his PhD. It's where he got the doctor in Dr. MLK. And, <laughs> That's uh, right. That's right. and, uh, and I found this place. And that, I think, that, that space contributed more to my development than any class I ever took. Um, it was there that I dove very deeply into the traditions of social justice in the United States and across the world. It was there that I studied Howard Thurman, which, um, which you know, for, for individuals who don't know who Howard Thurman was, he was a, a mentor to Martin Luther King. He is just a, an intellectual giant in the American philosophical tradition. Um, and he, you know, one of his most notable works is The Search for Common Ground, which is really, I think, about the quest and journey for healing in America and how we chart our path forward. And so I spent so much time in community studying the works of, of, of Thurman, of King, of so many people in the tradition. Um, we read poetry, we read Nikki Giovanni, we, we did all of it. And, wow. um, wow. and it's also where I found kind of my core group, I would say, uh, socially of friends um, that I, I have been privileged to, 
to call friends throughout my life. Um, and that is where I think a, a huge core of my moral, but that's also when I think the moral started to, to shift in the into the political. Um, and I didn't, you know, I, I, in that kind of tradition of my parents, um, I never was like, I am a Democrat with a capital D. If it's got a blue sticker, I'm gonna be for that. You know, I always grew up with this idea of, you know, you need to have an independent analysis of each and every individual and look at things in context. Um, and so, you know, it was it was around that time also that that first or, or second year was when I phone banked for Barack Obama for the first time. That was the first time I did any sort of electoral organizing. Um, and, you know, I, I and I say electoral organizing because I believe my parents were natural organizers. I don't think that they would have ever called themselves that. But um, growing up, you know, there was a there was like a Dunkin Donuts in town. And my mother would invite the women behind the cashier over <laughs> to our house for, <laughs> for dinner, you know. And so if you were a working person, um, our place was the spot. And so, but it was, so it was my first time I electorally organized. I remember the morning after Barack Obama was elected, you know, my father ha had passed away um, shortly before that time. Um, and I remember just like it, it the, the air, the morning after he elected smelled different. Like that's how it really felt. Um, mm. But then of course, you know, going on through my academic career, having that tool and that analysis of my parents, I was still able to say, these are decisions that I think are okay. These are decisions that I really don't think are okay. I remember um, when the Bush tax cuts were extended and mm -hmm. uh, when the Affordable Care Act uh, was passed, Those both of those things happened when I was in college. And just remembering um, feeling deeply conflicted, you know, mm -hmm. the Affordable Care Act, I thought, was, was wonderful in the extensions and the protections that it offered. Um, but I also had this feeling of why are there so, why is there so much conditionality to healing people mm -hmm. in the first place at all? And so let me, let me ask you a question right there because you, this is fantastic. I mean, I, my head's blown. Um, the Thurman Center, you know, I mean, I don't know, did you study with Walter Fluker maybe um, there, you know, and certainly Jesus and the Disinherited, you know, it mm -hmm. seems like you probably read that, I'm sure, closely because it mirrors a lot of what you're saying. But, you know, it seems like that path wouldn't have been an electoral path. Right. No, that path I didn't think is a social electoral. justice path. So I'm just so curious. I mean, you have faith in the possibility of the system that I frankly haven't I'm not sure ever had. So how how did you really take that tradition and infuse it into an electoral framework? Was it a conscious decision not to become, not to focus that kind of political and spiritual energy on a sort of more external uh, activism to change the system from the outside? Or how yeah. did you wrestle with that tension? If, if you, you know, had, if you had that tension? I, at that time, I did not think electoral politics was for me. I didn't think it was something that would ever um, be really in my path because I felt like I really felt in that time that if you were going to be and pursue elected office, you could not be an authentic human being. And it wasn't a that it wasn't a judgment. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, that all elected officials are bad people or, or are purposefully inauthentic or anything like that. But just the nature of this work, um, in order to get a majority, you have to appeal to so many people that to be ferociously yourself um, was just not something that you could do. And at that time, even now, but especially at that time, it's like, how many people have pursued elected office while they were closeted, in the closet in the past, or hiding the fact that they were in debt, or hiding this, that, or the other thing so that you could be a palatable figure that you could put on a glossy little mailer or whatever, you know, to have this perfect family and this manicured everything. Um, 
in order to be deemed acceptable, which is really what an election is. Really, it's mm. do I find this acceptable? And um, I did not feel like my how I conducted myself was uh, acceptable <laughs> in a modern <laughs> political framework. I am blunt, as people know. Um, I challenge some of the basic predicates that our society takes for granted. I don't believe that capitalism is like the best thing ever and that people that like, I don't know, we can capitalism our, our way out of poverty. And um, so I didn't think that this was going to be my path, um, but how I came to it was that I, you know, I, I think about it in, in terms of relationship um, because politics ultimately is about the scaffolding of our relationships to each other. And the reason our politics are so broken right now is because our relationships to one another as a society are very deeply broken. Um, and, and so how I came to it was that I became cynical. I said, Goldman Sachs finances both, especially in 2012, you know, I remember feeling just deeply saddened. So I was like, Goldman Sachs is a top contributor to both of these presidential campaigns. The Bush mm -hmm. tax cuts, it got extended overwhelmingly, which will, which are only making the rich richer and the poor poorer. And at the time I was studying economics, I was studying the and, and in particular, I studied developmental economics, which is the economics of the developed world, and also the, the economics, how economies develop as well. So not just the, not just the developing world, um, but also the United States. And so that means I studied the Gini coefficient, which is the measure of inequality. And I was seeing how the United States was careening uh, just mathematically on levels of income inequality that matched or surpassed those of some of the most aristocratic economies in Latin America and, and other parts of the world. And I just saw two parties both making decisions that made things worse. And one made decisions that made things worse on an accelerated timeline, and others were making decisions or compromises that made things worse on a uh, on a decelerated timeline. But it was really a decision of an elevator going down or an escalator going down, and um, and so I felt this isn't for me. And so my first work was social justice work. I graduated college and I moved back to the Bronx, and I said, you know, I don't know exactly what I wanna do, but I know that I want to address um, the issue that was at the core of my life's uh, inequality, which is education and particularly early childhood education. And so I went back to the Bronx and I organized uh, with the National Hispanic Institute um, with young children. And I was working with middle schoolers and second graders on um, how to tell stories where they are the hero. And I felt that that was something that was very deeply important because children, you know, I grew up, I, I was born in the Bronx and my parents had to make, or they felt that they had to make the decision to move to Westchester County. And, um, you know, we were the underclass, we served the wealthy in Westchester County so that I could go to school with wealthy kids. Um, and so my mother cleaned houses and I would read books on the staircases of wealthy people's homes while she vacuumed and cleaned toilets and all of that. And, um, and I always knew in growing up since the time I was a child that the quality of your education just being born um, based on the zip code that that you were born in uh, is wrong. And so I said, you know what, I'm just gonna start informed by my own life and I'm just gonna go and work with children and work with young people and work with teenagers and uh, work with the community and to be a mentor to younger people. And that was the first work that I did. Um, the financial crisis had caught up. My father's passing had caught up. My mother was about to lose her home. And so um, working with young people as immensely fulfilling as it is, uh, did not pay the bills enough <laughs> to make sure that we could stay in our home. And that's when I started waitressing. I could make all cash 
bring it home in my pocket. I'd stuff $200 in a purse or I'd save up $100 in a purse or, you know, the other thing too is that I grew up with the with the that was a profoundly radicalizing experience because that's like the best case scenario. That's a great day if you can put two hundred dollars in your purse. That's like, <laughs> woo, wow. <laughs> but sometimes I would walk home after hours of work with forty dollars in my purse, um, and doing backbreaking work with no breaks, um, you know, and no health insurance and no benefits and no protections. And really, you know, it, I, I was working four years in one of the most exploitative environments mm -hmm. in the country, which is the food industry. And so I was shoulder to shoulder with the undocumented, um, even if you are working in what is known as a front of house, if you are a waitress or a hostess, you are economically marginalized. Many of the people I worked with, you know, were there as an accident, almost, I would say, of circumstance. Um, so many of the people that I worked with had parents that passed away uh, or they were, you know, just born in, in circumstances that that led to these outcomes. Whereas, you know, in society, we're taught that you're there because that is what you deserve, right? That that is what mm -hmm. you have. You didn't work hard enough. Mm -hmm. You didn't work mm -hmm. hard enough. You didn't educate yourself enough that you had messed up in some way to land you in that position, right. as opposed to our social structures having right. failed right. people. Um, well, I actually, the, it, it succeeded in the sense that it was intentional, right? Um, right, exactly. Yeah. Which yeah. is what we <laughs> learned, right? Which is that African Americans or Latinos with a college degree do not do not come close to meeting the economic outcomes as non college educated whites because of the yep. inertia of generational injustice. Um, <laughs> And but so, at the same know, time, at the same time, my dear sister, it, it, it's very clear that you have a special calling. You have a very unique vocation. Uh, and it, this is just such a, a rich dialogue because I just, we, mm -hmm. we, the world needs to see just how rich you mm -hmm. are in depth and breadth, bringing together intellect and a, a spirituality, bringing together courage as well as a fortitude uh, uh, so that it's not just politician. It's a particular mm -hmm. kind of states person in a political system that's right. trying to be a force for good, driven by moral and sp spiritual forces, really. And by mm -hmm. spiritual, all I mean is empathy and imagination. Mm -hmm. You gotta imagine yourself in the, in the skin of somebody else. You have to be able to open your ego enough in order to get out of your narcissistic predicament and connect with somebody else. That's part of our problem these days mm -hmm. in America. We just got a narcissistic society across yeah. the board. But also it, by moral, I mean, integrity, honesty, decency, Malcolm X used to say, sincerity is the best credential. Say what you mean, mean what you say. That's just an AOC, ain't no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes now, you know, how does one intervene at this particular moment being true to all of these different dimensions of yourself, because you know the mainstream is going to try to reduce you down to one niche, one label, one category, one particular way of looking at the world. How do you sustain that and still give the world the gifts that you were put here to give? I mean, that's, yeah. it sounds abstract, but it's a very moral and spiritual question in a way. Yeah. And it's more than charisma. People talk about your charisma. Oh, Lord, oh, the sister got charisma. But it's more than that. Oh, yes. It's, it's, it's a whole organic coming together in AOC at this particular historical moment. Well, I think um, in this context, what is what I find to be this, the spiritual practice that I have been practicing the most or perhaps discipline that I've been practicing the most um, ever since I even won my primary um, is non-attachment. Um, and that is very, I think it is the most important thing in my position 
because politics, the intimidation, the pressure, the the immense, immense uh, intimidation and pressure to conform is entirely mm. based around your attachment to these things. If I can threaten what you are attached to, then if I can take away something that you are attached to, then I can make you do what I want you to do. And so what mm. I have to practice every day is non-attachment to the things that we are naturally attached to. Um, for example, attachment to my office. I cannot be attached to keeping my seat as a member of Congress um, if I'm going to do my job. Because my job is not to be the Congresswoman of New York's 14th district. My, or I, I guess I should say that is my job. That is not my mission. Mm, oh, yes. Okay. And yes, yes. my mission is to advance principles of a better world and to advance a better world. And um, that is my mission. And if I am overly attached to this seat, I cannot do my job. And so, you know, the first thing I have to do is practice non-attachment to my seat. I made decisions in my first, um, I made decisions in my first year in Congress from the very first day, joining a sit-in at Nancy Pelosi's office. I remember, um, I remember that. <laughs> I, I made decisions that I knew would result in a primary challenge against me that I knew was inviting millions of dollars to be dumped against me in my election. And I had to practice non-attachment and saying, I do not need this. I cannot need this if I am going to advance a better world. I have to practice non-attachment to ego and to esteem. I cannot be attached to social acceptance in a small class of powerful and wealthy people. If I am attached to being to social acceptance in that class, which frankly are my colleagues in Congress, um, I will not be able to do my job. And that in particular was extremely painful because a lot of mm. people see the outside mm. You know, they'll see my Twitter feed. They will see my picture in the news. Um, but it, my first year was very painful because I would walk into rooms and, you know, it's your work. It's your job, right? If you work in a university or if you work in a restaurant or what have you, imagine going to work every day and your coworkers, who you respect, you may not agree with them, but you respect them, um, turn their backs on you, you know, 90% of them. Um, mm. Or they speak about you in bad ways, or they undermine you, or they send, you know, or they speak about you anonymously to the press, um, saying terrible or just cruel things. Mm. And that was, um, it, you know, that doesn't even have to do with ego or seat or station. It's just human beings are wired for community and acceptance. And, um, and it was very painful because once you are a member of Congress, physically, you're voting in Washington, D.C. four out of seven days a week. And so I found myself going through this whiplash of going home to my community on the weekends and people saying, keep going, thank you, keep fighting. And then flying, taking a, uh, flying or, or taking a train to Washington and people feel and just being treated or feeling like I'm a bad person. Um, it was very hard. And so you have to practice non-attachment to that as well. You have to practice mm -hmm. non-attachment financially That's right wild. because um, as much as there's all of this fame and all of this stuff um even just legally like i can't 
I, I don't like make any money on the side. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm a member of Congress. And so if you lose your job, you know, you lose your income as well. And so you know, uh, you have I to think it, but it, 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 in your mother's church, I think it would be put in terms of being in the world, but not of it. Exactly. You know, all of these mm -hmm. penultimate things, you got to wear like a loose garment. Mm -hmm. Because what That's you exactly. are focused on is the needs and sufferings of everyday people and find yeah. joy in serving them whatever your job is, whatever mm. your position is, whatever your station is. But mm. you have been able to get inside of a system. I remember when, uh, I forget the senator from Wisconsin, uh, when he left, he said, I think Congress has legalized bribery and normalized corruption with this big money going everywhere. Where's the integrity? I can't find it anymore. Russell, I forget his last name. You all know who I'm talking about. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he just laid it out. I said, now how is it that Sister ANC gets in there and people are so hungry and thirsty for something deeper than just the legalized bribery and normalized corruption and they do focus on you and some others too, mm -hmm. no doubt, but especially, especially your leadership. And then the expectations become so overwhelming on the one hand, and yet you continue to bear witness to that. I call it in some sense, it's the afterlife of your father in your life, just mm -hmm. as it's the magnificent life of your mother still alive, thank God, in your life. And and to you to, for you to have to deal with that day in and yeah. day out. I know Brother yes. Riley helps out, and God bless him as well. But I mean, still, <laughs> I, I, how do you wrestle right, with right. that? Yeah, I mean, I I I spent, you know, when my father passed away, the last thing he ever told me was make me proud. And I was that eighteen. Right? Ooh, those are his exact words. Those were his exact words. My and that was God. the last thing I, my father told me before he had passed away. And so talk about raised expectations. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> it wow. was, um, you know, and so in terms of the difficulty, um, ever since then, uh, you know, after that moment, I was just extremely hard on myself. Um, mm. and, um, it was a weight that I carried for a very long time. And, you know, when I was, when I was working in a restaurant, I, I, it, I just, I, I just was, I had an agony because I felt like I wasn't keeping my promise. Um, and that, you know, that of course is, is attached to all of the internalized things that we are talk that we are told like what is valuable. Um, right, and right. It, got, it got to such a hard point for me that I had to make a decision that I'm either going to destroy myself or I am going to, um, or I am going to, to, to be good. I, I, I had to choose between, I had to choose myself. Um, mm, and, mm. Uh, and that required a different understand. I was either going to continue to think of myself poorly, or I had to change my understanding of the world, and I had to change my my precepts. Um, and um, but it was an enormous, enormous amount of pressure that I had felt on myself. And um, and so you know when when I won my primary, there were these insane external expectations. No one person is a messiah. <laughs> and, no. um, and I just wanted to like tell everyone like, whoa, hold on. I'm a normal human being. And that you're is just one soul. human being. <laughs> and just one. Um, yeah. Doing their best. Right. And I tried to communicate that in as many ways as I could, even, you know, trying to cook dinner on Instagram with people like that was me trying to find fellowship. Um, right. And I, I made those decisions of, in, of, of intentional vulnerability. You know, I knew that going on Instagram at 10 o'clock at night, while 
I'm chopping carrots. I'm going to say something after a long day. I'm going to say something that perhaps is grammatically incorrect or politically incorrect <laughs> or something. Um, but I chose yeah. to do it anyway because I needed to break the mythology of perfection in people who hold power because mm. I felt that if people saw vulnerability and flaw in me, then they would also apply that vulnerability and flaw to other people in positions of power that tried to hide that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, if people saw me as a human being, maybe they would see Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell or a chair or anybody as a human being making decisions too. And um, I remember, you know, I, if you read, um, you know, Dostoevsky, and there's this whole passage um, where he talks about power in the in story of Christ. And, um, and there's all of these kind of things that contribute to power, mm. but power is mostly about illusion. And it's mostly about, it, it, it's entirely illusion. And so how you manicure the illusion contributes to the strength of power. And I knew that I was in an institution that didn't deserve the power that it held um, mm. because of how corrupted it had become. Yeah. And mm. so I needed to pull back the curtains. That's why I told people that there were lobbyists in our new member <laughs> orientation. That's why yeah. I let people see Boy. myself mess up because I'm not the only one. You know, but you and know, I, you've been you've been pulling that curtain. You pull that curtain you, on many um, occasions. It's a many. Wizard of Oz over and over again. It, Look who's really here, you are. Right, right. But you know what's so powerful, and I think we have like a minute left with you because I know you have a hard departure, mm -hmm. like in maybe forty five seconds. But um, but you know that pulling the curtain that both of you were talking about is not only extraordinary in terms of telling stories about the way power is operating, but also it means that you don't have to be perfect, right? And and exactly. I think that's extremely important. That's right. And then, then we're not that's getting right. into this illusion of perfection. We're saying beneath that illusion, who are you really trying to be most mm -hmm. of the time? And mm -hmm. we're just so profoundly inspired by you and blessed to meet you and hear about your journey because, you know, you don't have to be perfect to, you know, be the next president, but you'll be old enough. I hear. <laughs> and so, you know, give it some thought. probably one of the worst jobs in the world. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty bad, actually. I would never do it. But, but you know, you look. So you, never you're know, taking... never know what your calling is, though. You never know what you never calling know. Is, you I'm never know. You. Well, let me tell you, you got a squad and a whole lot of other people out here will get your back if you make that, make that call. But, um, but we're just so honored to have you join us and to share so much of your life journey and, and thoughts with us. I'm just super grateful. Yeah. Thank you this so is, much. It's just been magnificent. The world just see all of the complexity, the richness and all of the various dimensions that the mainstream press doesn't have the capacity to keep track of, of your richness. You know what they're I mean? They're not even asking the questions, they, right? They, no, they're absolutely. Yeah, but we we, we we love you. We respect you. And you know my prayers are with you. And it goes yes, the and other way Come around. back anytime. Anytime you want to come talk and, or, you know, just you got an open invitation whenever you're free and want to chat. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you both so very much.